各位现场和线上的来宾 ，online and on-site guests, good morning. Welcome to the 11th annual International Conference on the Chinese Economy, organized by Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. Welcome to the annual International Conference on the Chinese Economy, organized by the HKIML. Today's sessions will be conducted in two languages. Putonghua and English. Please choose your preferred language channel on your screen. First of all, let's invite the Chief Executive of Hong Kong MA, Mr. Eddie Yu, to deliver welcome remarks. Mr. Yu, please. Mr. Leung, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to this seminar. Due to the impacts of COVID-19, this year's conference is held in a hybrid mode, combining online and offline formats. And I'm pleased to see so many experts and scholars attending this event. The theme of this year is on the path to common prosperity, China's economic development in due circulation. The agenda of this conference is tightly packed. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Lung Guoqiang, Deputy Director of the Development Research Center of the State Council, for giving the keynote speech at this seminar out of his busy schedule. His speech will certainly help us understand some of the latest economic policies of the mainland and forecast the direction of the next economic development. After more than 40 years of reform and opening up, China has made tremendous economic achievements. The overall national strength and the living standard of the people have been improved to an unprecedented extent. However, the problem of uneven economic development is still prominent. The rapid developments of technology and industries, whilst promoting economic development, has had a structural impact on employment and income distribution. And the gap between the rich and the poor has widened. In addition, the international economic environment facing China has recently undergone significant changes. How do we understand some of the recent hot issues in China's economy and government policies? This is crucial to our understanding of China's economy and financial markets and our prediction of the next steps. In this morning's session, we have invited experts from the financial sector to give an in-depth analysis and discussion on these hot topics. Population aging is a serious problem for many economies in this century. Advances in medical technology and improvements in living standards have led to people living longer and longer. At the same time, there has been a general decline in birth rates. These have led to a rapid aging of the population. China is no exception. Let me give you some figures. According to the 7th National Census, China's elderly population aged over 65 reached 190 million in 2020, accounting for 13.5% of the total population. This is close to the 14% threshold for an aging society recognized by the United Nations. In 149 cities at the prefectural level and above, the proportion of people aged 65 and above has already exceeded 14%. At the same time, the total birth rate is only 1.3, which is already below the internationally recognized alert level of 1.5. According to official statistics for the first half of 2021, the total number of births in 13 provinces and cities fell by 17.2% year-on-year. Population experts predict that China's total population could experience negative growth this year. So these figures are telling us clearly that China is facing the fastest and the largest wave of aging in human history. 
talking about population aging, Japan is the most aging country in the world. According to the latest snapshot of statistics released by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications of Japan in September 2021, 29.1% of the population is aged 65 or above. Economists believe that the aging of the population has profound implications for the economy and financial markets after summing up Japan's experience. This is reflected in a slowdown in potential economic growth, a decline in technological innovation, a deterioration in income distribution, a contraction in aggregate demand, especially investment demand, a deflation, a fall in real interest rates, a plunge in real estate prices, an increase in the government's fiscal burden, a rise in the debt ratio, and a rise in macro leveraging ratio. All these problems may arise as a result of population aging. The question of whether a similar situation will occur in the Chinese economy is an urgent one to be studied. In the afternoon session of today's seminar, we are pleased to have two experts discussing these issues in depth. Aging population poses a serious challenge to the sustainability of pensions. In this seminar, we have invited Professor Wang Jiangmin, former Vice Chairman of the National Council of Social Security Foundations, to give us an introduction to the construction of China's pension system, as well as his analysis and policy recommendations on the sustainability of pensions. As the second largest economy in the world, China has made tremendous contributions to global financial stability and economic development. Since the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, the People's Bank of China has signed currency swap agreements with the central banks of 38 countries and regions, amounting to nearly 33.1, uh, sorry, 3.1 trillion RMB. Over the past 20 years, the Chinese government has restructured nearly 60 billion USD of debt of 64 countries, directly waived about 22 billion USD of that debt, accounting for about 37% of the total debt restructuring. This afternoon, two experts have been invited to discuss the role of China's currency swaps and debt restructuring in the financial stability and economic development of the beneficiary economies. So the annual international conference on uh, China's economy at the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research is an open platform for experts, acad academics, and policymakers to discuss the latest developments in China's economy. In the past, it has attracted a large number of contributions of articles from teams of central bankers from around the world studying the Chinese economy. This year was no exception. The seminar will conclude with two research papers from the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. We hope that you will take full advantage of this platform and participate actively in the discussions and presentations. Finally, I would like to wish this seminar a great success and hope that you can all come to Hong Kong for next year's seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Eddie Yu. In the next session, we are very honored to have Mr. Long Guo Tiang, Vice President of the Development Research Center of the State Council, to deliver a keynote speech. Mr. Long, good morning. Thank you very much for delivering the keynote speech for us this morning. Thank you. So can we start now? Before you start, 
May I briefly introduce you? Mr. Long has been working in research about external economic policies of China. He is an expert in macroeconomic industrial policies. Very often he takes part in economic analysis and uh, policy research meetings of the State Council. In 2007, Mr. Long actually uh, did a few lectures uh, for the authority. The Development Research Center of the State Council is an important think tank for the central government. It actually gives very specific and concrete recommendations to the central government to facilitate formal, uh, formulation of policy. So now, let's welcome Mr. Long to make his keynote speech. Mr. Long, please. Thank you. The Honorable Mr. Yu, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is an honor to be invited to participate in the 11th Annual International Conference on the Chinese Economy, organized by the Hong Kong Institute for Monetary and Financial Research. The theme of the seminar was on the path to common prosperity, China's economic development in due circulation which is highly the theoretical, practical, and contemporary. In 2020, China successfully achieved its first 100-year goal of eradicating absolute poverty and building a moderately well-off society, which has laid a more solid foundation for promoting common prosperity. In the new journey towards becoming a modernized and powerful country, China will be based on a new stage of development, comprehensively implement the new development concepts, accelerate the building of a new development pattern, achieve high quality development, and solidly promote common prosperity. Today, I'm happy to have this opportunity to talk about this theme on promotion of common prosperity and achieving high quality development. So let me share with you three key points. One, common prosperity is the essential requirement of socialism. Common prosperity is the common aspiration of mankind and has been the constant pursuit of the Chinese people for thousands of years, as well as the original mission of the Communist Party of China. After the establishment of New China, in 1953, the resolution of the Central Committee of the Communist Party on, of China on the development of agricultural production cooperatives first advocated common prosperity. During reform and opening up, Mr. Deng Xiaoping proposed that poverty is not socialism and decided to break the shackles of the traditional system and allow some people to become rich first so that they can lead other people to become rich later and achieve common prosperity. President Xi Jinping pointed out that allowing people to share the fruits of reform and development is an essential requirement of socialism, a central expression of the superiority of the socialist system and an important manifestation of our party's adherence to the fundamental purpose of serving the people wholeheartedly. Promoting common prosperity in a developing country with a large population like China is long-term arduous and complex. In the international context, income inequality is a global challenge with the, with the polarization of the rich and the poor and the collapse of the middle class in some countries, leading to social disintegration, political polarization, and populism and the lessons learned are profound. China has been attaching much importance to preventing polarization and promoting common prosperity. On 17th August 2021, the Central Finance and Economics Commission held its 10th meeting to study the promotion of common prosperity and to answer some of the major theoretical and policy questions on common prosperity. After that meeting, 
we can see that in many different seminars, on many occasions, in the media, on the internet, uh, those main points were discussed. And people gave many comments about common prosperity. Of course, some remarks or some views are not really very accurate. Concerning common prosperity, during that meeting, there have been many answers given to important uh, theories and policy issues. So first of all, what is common prosperity? Common prosperity is the prosperity of the entire population, not the prosperity of a few. It is the prosperity of both the material and spiritual lives of people, not just material prosperity, but spiritual emptiness. It is common prosperity with certain disparity, not uniform egalitarianism. And what is the timetable of achieving common prosperity? Again, during the meeting, there has been an overall arrangement given. So the promotion of common prosperity requires long-term struggle and cannot be achieved overnight. Development should be gradual and orderly and should be advanced in stages. By the end of the 14th five-year plan, the common prosperity of all people will have taken a solid step forward, and the gap between residents' income and actual consumption levels will have been gradually reduced. By 2035, basic public services will be equalized. By the middle of this century, the common prosperity of all people will be basically achieved, and the gap between people's income and real consumption levels will be reduced to a reasonable level. So you can see that this can only be achieved after uh, a long period of time of hard work. So how do we achieve common prosperity? Some people are worried that there would be uh, the idea of robbing the rich to help the poor or welfareism. So common prosperity cannot be promoted by robbing the rich to help the poor, nor by welfareism beyond the stage of development, but by joint creation. We must encourage hard work and innovation to get rich, insist on safeguarding and improving people's livelihoods in the course of development, create more inclusive and equitable conditions for people to improve their education and development capabilities, open up channels of upward mobility, create opportunities for more people to get rich, and create a development environment in which everyone can participate, we must adhere to the basic economic system, base ourselves on the primary stage of socialism, adhere to the two unshaken principles, adhere to the public ownership system as the mainstay, and the joint development of the economy of multiple ownership systems. Allow some people to get rich first so that they can help and lead others to become rich later and focus on encouraging those who work hard, operate legally, and dare to start their own businesses to lead the way to prosperity. You may not really understand what is the basic economic system. Actually, in 1997, during the 15th uh, Congress, concerning the uh, public ownership system, well, that was uh, determined as the basic uh, economic system. And for the two unshakable principles, the first one is that we must reinforce and develop the public ownership system. And the other thing is, the other principle is to encourage, support, and guide the non-public um, ownership system. So in other words, in order to achieve common prosperity at the beginning stage of economic development, it will be gradually uh, promoted and advanced. And then concerning high quality of development as a means to achieve common prosperity. Now, promotion of common prosperity must, be, um, must start from China's realities. First, China's level of development is not yet high. Development is not thorough or adequate enough. China is still a developing country with per capita GDP of just over 10,000 USD and has not yet entered the ranks of high-income countries. Per capita income is 
apparently lower than that in developed countries, not reaching even one-sixth of the U.S. We have just built a uh, all-round moderately well-off society. So the task of economic development is still very arduous. If we are uh, if we have to move towards common prosperity. Secondly, the problem of uneven and insufficient development is still prominent. Regional development is uneven. Our territory is huge. So the coastal, highly developed um, economic systems, especially those mega cities, enjoy high degree of development. But then there are also other uh, remote areas which lack behind. So their per capita income is relatively low. Besides, there is uneven distribution or uneven development between um, the urban area and the villages. In 2020, ratio of disposable income between urban and rural residents was 2.56 to 1. And the wealth gap is quite wide. The Gini coefficient of per capita income was 0 0.468. So in developing countries, there are still many people who are very rich. So actually, according to the, uh, according to the Forbes Rich List, uh, China ranks first in the world with 745 people uh, on the list. Therefore, in order to promote common prosperity, we have to do two things. First, we must continue to make the pie bigger. And secondly, we must share it well. To promote common prosperity, we must first of all continue to make the pie bigger. Uh, and fundamentally, we must rely on high quality development and increase labor productivity. To achieve high quality development, we must fully implement the new development concepts of innovation, coordination, green openness and sharing, and maintain sustainability of a reasonable economic growth rate. Only with high quality development can we cross the middle income trap, raise per capita income levels, and move um, from being internationally, uh, from being moderately well off to common prosperity. The promotion of common prosperity is also conducive to high quality development as it enables more low income groups to increase their income faster, enjoy better education and health care services, and improve human capital, thus laying a solid foundation for increasing total factor productivity and high quality development. Therefore, the promotion of common prosperity and high quality development are mutually reinforcing and complementary. The second thing is that we have to share the pie well. So this depends on deepening reform and establishing and improving institutional mechanisms that facilitate a fairer share of the fruits of development for all people. Relationship between efficiency and fairness must be correctly addressed, and a basic institutional arrangement must be established to coordinate the primary, uh, secondary, and tertiary distributions. The primary distribution is the basis for striking a balance between equity and efficiency, improving national income patterns, increasing proportion of residents' income, and growing the middle income group. The secondary distribution should be fair, and efforts should be made to achieve a balance between equality of opportunity, equality of process, and equality of outcome. So many people will say that at the end of the day, income of everyone will be the same, but then in fact, we are talking about fairness in terms of outcome. At the same time, we also need to make sure that there is equality in opportunities and process. And then the third distribution should be um, the third distribution should be based on volunteerism, with greater tax and public opinion incentives for charity. Actually, we do have this cultural tradition that uh, we should help others, especially those who are needy. 
So if a person becomes rich, he and she should also make contribution to other people in the world. And things have to be more transparent. And importance should be given to integrity as well. The proportion of middle-income groups should be increased and the income of low-income groups should be raised. High income should be reasonably regulated and illegal income should be outlawed so as to form an olive-shaped distribution structure with a large middle part and smaller ends to promote social justice and all-round development of people. So that's the second area. Third point, building a new development pattern is an important pathway to common prosperity. As China enters a new stage of development, it is faced with major changes unprecedented in a century, profound changes in both the international environment and domestic development conditions. Just now, Mr. Yu at the beginning said a lot about major changes, both domestically and internationally. And then there are many, many challenges, and at the same time, new opportunities. For this reason, we have proposed to accelerate construction of a new development pattern in which the domestic circulation is the mainstay, and the international and domestic circulations should promote each other. The realization of this strategic task will give a strong impetus to high-quality development and promote common prosperity. After talking about a new development pattern, people have different discussions and understanding. My view is that in the international competition, we should maintain our autonomy, our control and safety and security. The key to building a new development pattern lies in the unimpeded flow of economic cycle, and there should be interaction between internal and external. We need to do a lot of work to make sure there is unimpeded flow of economic cycle. Firstly, we need to deepen structural reform on the supply side. We should strengthen innovation capabilities, optimize and upgrade our industrial structure, enhance autonomy and security of key links in the industrial chain and supply chain, strengthen resilience of our supply system, form a more efficient and higher quality input-output relationship achieve a dynamic balance in the economy at a high level, and better meet the needs of people in terms of consumption upgrading. Secondly, it is necessary to build a large and unified domestic market. We must establish an effective system for expanding domestic demand, unleash potential of domestic demand, accelerate cultivation of a complete domestic demand system, strengthen demand side management, expand consumer spending, and raise the level of consumption so that the building of a mega domestic market becomes a sustainable historical process. Thirdly, we should strive to promote positive interaction between domestic and international circulations. This kind of uh, structure between the international and domestic is important. Building a new development pattern is not a small or closed domestic cycle, but an open and international circulation. A stronger domestic economic circulation system and a solid foundation should be used to support a higher level of opening up to the outside world. And we should further raise the level of opening up to the outside world and integrate the two international and domestic resources and the two markets. At the same time, build new advantages for China's participation in international cooperation and competition and enhance efficiency and level of domestic cycle with the international cycle to improve the quality and allocation of China's production factors and promote the transformation and upgrading of China's industries. 
China's efforts to build a new development pattern and promote common prosperity will certainly contribute to further expansion of China's market size and upgrading of its industrial and consumption structures and bring a new investment market and cooperation opportunities to the inter international community. China will adhere to the concepts of peace, development, cooperation, and win-win, and will continue to expand and deepen its openness to the outside world, sharing new opportunities for the development with the international community. Finally, I wish the seminar great success. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long, for the keynote speech. Very clearly, Mr. Long had pointed to us the true meaning of common prosperity and also how common prosperity is to be implemented and achieved. Next, we will have Mr. Long answer a few questions of ours. A lot of uh, participants and experts, while uh, registering, had already raised a few questions for Mr. Long. And we will be raising these questions uh, for those who are present in the venue. And for those who are not present in the venue who have raised questions, I will ask the questions on their behalf. Now, first of all, from IFC World Bank, uh, Ms. Wan, uh, would you speak up, please? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Long. And, uh, we thank the Hong Kong uh, MA and also the Academy for organizing this opportunity. Now, just now, it had been explained to us the implications and the timetable and also the effects of common prosperity. And definitely, this is very helpful for the reading and understanding of the concept of common prosperity. I have a couple of questions. First of all, for the non-SOEs, for the uh, civic economy and the companies, what does it mean? What does common prosperity mean? Would there be more industries which will have to become non-profit making in the future and in the mid to long term? with uh, common prosperity, would certain industries be coming under more stringent regulation and adjustments? Uh, it would be great if you can provide some highlights on this. And next, concerning uh, adjustments of regulatory system and also the implementation of regulations. We see that for some of the policy adjustments, the intentions are great. It is to lower inequality in the society and also addressing some of the industry problems. But at the same time, it's brought on some investment and operation risks for the industries because some of the policies were made overnight and they were rather cookie cutter and the industries have not had the time to make adjustments. So in the mid to long term, for the industries to make adjustments to the regulatory changes, would there be better communication with the industries and the enterprises or companies with better coordination and communication with more clearer timetable so that investors and the companies will have better expectations as to what is to come and to make the relevant adjustments where necessary. So that's my second question. Very much looking forward to Mr. Long's sharing. Thank you for these questions. And these are very focused questions. And I'm sure they are the areas of concern for a lot of people. Now, for the uh, common prosperity, what does it mean to the private economy or the privately held companies? Well, common prosperity in our economic system, it is to be implement, implemented uh, on the basis of our economy. So the private sector will have to shoulder its responsibility for common prosperity. So that is to say they will have to participate into the higher quality of development and also the new mode of uh, development. So this is a major target an objective, common prosperity. Everybody will have to pitch in, and the private sector will have a very big role to play, and its responsibility will be big as well. 
Common prosperity for the development of the private sector, I think it will bring on a lot of new opportunities. First of all, common prosperity would mean that our income structure, the distribution of income would be much fairer, and the citizens income would be rising, and also the community of higher income uh, earners would be increasing. So for consumption of consumer groups and services will rise, and the, there will be higher quality of goods and services which will be consumed. So this gives the private sector a new opportunity to satisfy these high quality needs. And at the same time, we see not only higher quality consumption, but high quality development or common prosperity. It has to be based on the labor efficiency. Labor efficiency will have to rise. Without that, it is impossible to achieve prosperity because prosperity is based on development. So high quality development, high quality uh, labor efficiency is based on innovation and also industry structure uh, optimization. So in terms of the supply side, there will be uh, something new as well. The sector, the private sector, will be more vibrant and also in achieving common prosperity. So whether it is from the industry side or on the demand side or consumption side, it would bring on new opportunities stemming from demand, making the private sector more innovative and also raising their market competitiveness. So common prosperity is not about some people are concerned that this is robbing the rich to uh, save the poor, or is it all about equality? No. The answer to these questions, and to my mind, it is clear that achieving common prosperity, overall speaking, is going to be beneficial in forwarding the private sector's development. And also privately held companies will be raising the quality and also will be raising their competitiveness. So these are opportunities. Your second question relates to regulatory improvements. This is an important question. For all our policies and regulations, as you have pointed out just now, the intention is to, for the regulated industries, and the enterprises to be more regulated so that they can be healthier for further growth. And in this, there are two main areas of efforts. First of all, on the part of the government in coming up with uh, policies, the introduction of policies and the implementation of policies, they should be more orderly and to provide the enterprises time for adjustments. And secondly, the enterprises or companies themselves would have to make an effort. They will have to strengthen their research and understanding into their industry and also the understanding of the policies. For some industries, they already have certain problems within them, but the companies within the industry uh, do not address them and they ignore them. And as a result, when the policies come out, they are at a loss. So this is a common effort. Everybody has to put uh, pitch in so that in the policies implementation, there will be more orderly and stable uh, implementation, and the economy and the industries will grow uh, more healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Next, we have Mr. Feng Xiaozhong from uh, Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Long. I've been taking notes all along as you were speaking, and I hear high quality and better uh, sharing of the pie. And on hearing these, I am very expectant and I'm very hopeful. My question is, geopolitics had been very complex, and the economic situation had been complicated as well. Now, you were talking about staged 
uh, common prosperity, and there is a final timetable. And you also said to uh, the orderliness is also very important. Now, I would like to follow up on the last uh, questioner's question, and that is, how do you address these complexities, and how do you come up with uh, policies that are in keeping with the time? Uh, that is in keeping with these realities, with its complexities. And uh, for example, in education platform, in uh, medical and health, et cetera, uh, in all these relevant uh, industries, you know, how do you uh, see the policies going forward? Uh, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. I just want to make sure that I do. Are you saying uh, long-term plans and short-term implementation flexibility? Was that your question? Uh, yes. That's what I meant. All right. Uh, so this is a very important uh, point. As a large country, we have to have long-term planning for our development in the major areas of economic and social growth. We need to have mid to long-term plans to lead us onwards to our development. But at the same time, we also have to be cognizant of a Chinese saying, that is, a thousand miles start with the first step. So we have to be concerned about our present. And it is based on accumulation of our past experience. And our actions at the moment, of course, will be well considered. And it will be addressing some of the opportunities that we have now to resolve some of the problems that we have now. With long-term uh, objective, at the same time, resolving some of the present problems or issues, we want to, as we achieve the latter, we at the same time are marching towards our long-term plan and target. Otherwise, in resolving uh, present opportun uh, opportunities or short-term problems, Sometimes it can be diverse and different from the long-term goal. So the two will have to go hand in hand. Now, you have pointed out some geopolitical political issues. And also, domestically, there are some short-term market fluctuation issues, et cetera. So these are issues that we have at present. And in resolving these issues, and challenges, we will have to, at the same time, be clear as to how we are proceeding towards the long-term development plans so that we find the right path for resolving the present issues. Because in resolving issues, we have a lot of different tools and different options. So as much as possible, uh, we want to integrate the two, long-term goals and short-term solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Our next question for the participants here. Uh, here's a question about with the new common prosperity, the Hong Kong economy and its role, would it be different? For example, the financial industry and the financial institutions, would there be new roles for them under common prosperity? Well, the answer is affirmative, for sure. Hong Kong's role is continually uh, transforming. And Hong Kong had always played a very important role in the development of the country at different stages of time. Its function, its content, its role had been different. In the past, in our rapid industrialization process, Hong Kong was a, an important window and channel for the country. 
bringing in a lot of FDI through Hong Kong into the mainland for investments. And in extending our export, Hong Kong had played an important role in being the shop front and uh, back manufacturing base role so as to open up new markets internationally and providing service in international trade, in maritime services, and in financing. Hong Kong had a very ro important role to play in all those. And in high quality growth, and also with this dual circulation domestic and international, with this process, Hong Kong likewise will have a very important role to play. In high quality growth and development compared to the past, there is a main uh, difference, and that is its impetus of growth. In the past, for rapid industrialization, it was really about production elements, putting in a lot of resources in that, and also exporting to address a problem of shortage of uh, foreign currency. So that was the past. And today, when we talk about high quality growth, more so we are relying on innovation and also the uh, optimization of the industries. And also in the international supply chain, we upgrade ourselves so that our labor efficiency is also raised so that we can finally achieve common prosperity. And without prosperity itself, we cannot have common prosperity. And in that, we will have to have better innovative capabilities. We will have to use the two markets, domestic and international, uh, to provide for that. And just now, you have all mentioned different challenges, but at the same time, there are major opportunities which we will be have to be very clear about. First of all, uh, digital economy. It brings on a lot of opportunities. The digital transformation and also industrial transformation is universal. It is not for a country to close the doors and uh, ignore that mega trend. So digital trade, of course, is also picking up speed rapidly. And the elements for digital economy, uh, protection and safety for the digital economy, all these are important. And in that development process for a country such as China, which is catching up from behind, we are forging new uh, racetracks. Definitely, we'll be putting in a lot more emphasis in digital economy, and at the same time, we'll be using digital economy with its new technology, new models to raise and transform our traditional industries, such as fashion. Fashion was labor intensive originally. And with the labor costs rising, competitiveness of the industry had been gravely impacted. For example, there is a Qingdao company. It used digital technology to provide to the world customized service. And this customized service and uh, scale production, it had utilized these to transform itself from the traditional mode of operation. So it is a business model transformation as well as technological transformation. Digital technology, using that to raise uh, the business competitiveness. There is a lot of uh, opportunities therein. And low carbon is another area which will bring on a lot of opportunities. China right now for photovoltaic um, and wind uh, power, we are the biggest in terms of capacity for energy production in these regards, and also the biggest exporter. And uh, for the mm, low carbon emitting uh, cars, uh, we are the biggest production country for these innovative vehicles. And therefore, in this transformation, we will achieve high 
degree of growth and at the same time transforming some of the traditional uh, sectors of economy and industry. So there are a lot of opportunities. And Hong Kong, as the most open economy in China, in its next phase of development for China's uh, progress in bringing in digital technology and technology from overseas into China and integration of the resources in providing high-end talents pool and also providing financial services. All these are areas where Hong Kong will have a very important role to play. So high quality development and common prosperity and the transformation of the models, all these are major areas which will bring on new opportunities for Hong Kong going forward. And I'm sure the Hong Kong SAR government and the industries will definitely look into these new mega trends of development and strategies of China. And on that basis, we'll be able to grasp the relevant opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Long. So for our participants in the venue, any other questions, please? Next, I will ask a question from the uh, web. Just now, Mr. Long had talked about the future of the economy in uh, green economy and also in uh, digital economy. The question is, in the next five to 10 years for China's economic growth, which are the main industries to bring on these growth? And another uh, question was, in the past period of time, China had been focusing on consumer growth or consumption growth. How should we understand consumption growth going forward? For the U.S. style of consumption, whatever makes a consumer happy, that seems to be the byword. But that doesn't seem to be the case for China. So how should we understand consumption uh, growth in the future for China? Uh, interesting, very interesting questions. For China's development, we are relying on domestic demand. As a large economy, domestic demand in terms of size, its speed and its uh, changes will bring on our changes in the industries and also supply side changes. From consumption demand, you would be able to see in the past period of time, we have gone through the 1980s. It was basic about uh, basic consumption, clothing, food. And then in the 90s, it was about household uh, elect uh, electricals. And then it was about, after that, about housing, residential housing, uh, cars for the people at large. So it was about uh, transport and also housing. So every cycle had its own emphasis for the industries which experienced rap rapid growth. Now, for the consumption hotspots, it is not as focused as before, I would say. But there is a commonality, and that is the upgrading of consumption. As income rises, whether for your clothing, for your residential, or for your transport and cars, etc., everybody wants higher quality products and higher quality and better services. So in the future, this will be a major characteristic. Uh, so with the rising quality of consumption, it will bring on all the industries in their high quality development. So for high quality development, it is based on this domestic demand. As income rises, and also with the distribution of income, as a basis, at the same time, we also have to look at technological advances. This also brings on new innovations. For example, uh, the smartphone, 
with the invention of the smartphone, it has hugely changed the consumption behavior of the people. Smartphones and its uh, wide penetration in the population, uh, it has changed. Uh, the consumption behavior. People are not going to the shopping malls as much as before. They are buying online. People are always referring to their uh, smartphone for their consumptions. So the contents of consumption, the behavior of consumption, the style of consumption have all changed because of this. I have talked about uh, digital technology. It will cons continue to deepen. Uh, it is about mobile connection now, and in the future, it will be IoT. Everything will be connected, and there will be newer technologies and newer business models and newer business activities in the future. Green is another area of development. It will bring on new energy, new industry structure, and new consumption behavior. So. In the next 10, 20 years or even longer, China's development, whether it is domestic consumption from the consumption side or from technological innovation that is supply side, the commonality between the two is that there will be continuous innovation and also structural raising of standards and also higher quality products and services, so that there will be high quality development overall. So whoever will be able to grasp these opportunities will be the successful ones. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. We have a little bit of time for the last question. ANZ Bank, Mr. Yang Yuting, please. Uh, Mr. Long, I'm Yang Yuting of ANZ Bank. In the past few months, the financial market have been very concerned about the housing market in China. We know that in for some of the developers in China and their financial situations had brought on uh, questions about the stability of the economy of uh, China and whether a balance point can be reached. In the 14th five-year plan, uh, real estate and housing and its role in the overall economy and in bringing on common prosperity, Mr. Long, what do you think would be the role for the next three to five years or the development of the sector, that is, real estate sector, in the next, let's say, three to five years? And what are some of the changes, please? Well. With the new era, housing will be to satisfy the demands of the people, needs of the people in having housing. And uh, real estate sector had been growing, and investment into real estate is a quarter of the total. And China's uh, population and uh, Urban housing had been greatly enhanced. For example, in the ur urban areas, it is already over 30 square meters per person in living space. For some of the developing countries in the same income bracket, uh, this is faring well. But at the same time, as income rises and with uh, better services, there have been other changes. In rapid development of real estate, urban housing prices in the past period have been rising for a long time. In some big cities, housing price is very high. As a result, some people, especially young people, face huge pressure in solving housing problem. And in other industries, cost of human resources is also pushed up. And as a result, competitiveness is being undermined. So we have to really address this issue squarely and also associated problems. Recently, in the property market, 
there was a division. Housing prices in different cities um, behaved very differently now. In the past, prices all over the country rose. But then now in some cities, prices had been coming down. And in some other cities, prices continued to rise. So as President Xi said, uh, properties are for accommodation, not for speculation. So in other words, we have to go back to the fundamental nature of housing, and that is it is for accommodating people. Based on August data in 70 main cities, there are 20 cities in which the price uh, has come down on a year-on-year -year basis. So given this uh, division or given this variance among cities, well, people also make different predictions and forecasts. Some people are pessimistic. They are worried about problems in the property market. And some big property developers also face problems with the funding chain. Of course, there are also optimistic people. Yesterday, I read the news, and there is a very big foreign investment bank increasing shareholding of USD bond issued by property companies. So my personal judgment is if you look at the problems encountered by some big property developers, there won't be an overall uh, threat to the whole market because the overall property market of China is so huge. It's like the Pacific Ocean. So if there are problems with just a few uh, pieces of fish, there won't be overall impact on the ocean. So by adjusting and uh, managing the market, we would like to see healthy, sustainable development of the property sector in the coming three to five years. I believe that there would still be divergent development in some small to medium-sized cities. In some districts, there is outflow of population. So there's a lack of support or internal support for the property price. However, in some cities, there is huge uh, inflow of prop uh, population. So as a result, there is strong support for property price. So there would still be upward movement pressure. And the reason why the property market should be managed and controlled is to guard against um, excessive increase in property price. In some cities, there should be a multiple tier of housing supply. For example, there should be like public housing or social security housing to satisfy young people's housing need. Of course, through the market, people's demand for upgrading the housing can also be satisfied. So with a multiple layer property market, different people's needs can be satisfied. Overall speaking, I think the development trend in the property market will not be as fast as in the past. However, we believe that the property sector can develop in a healthy and stable way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Once again, thank you very much for your speech today. And thank you for answering so many questions for us. So the first session of today's conference should be concluded here because time is up. Our next session will start on time at 11.30. Thank you very much.